What's going on all of my healthcare brothers and sisters? I hope that you are having a wonderful day. We are continuing on with our ATIT's journey and we are gonna be discussing English and language usage when it comes to knowledge of language. Let's get started. So as always, we begin by looking at our objectives. So what you need to know for knowledge of language when it comes to the ATITs is that this section is going to have 11 items out of the total 33 that will be scored for the test. What you'll need to know is grammar to enhance clarity in writing, evaluate if language meets the needs of an audience for provided rhetorical context, and develop a well-organized paragraph. So we begin by looking at complete sentences. So a complete sentence is made up of a subject and a predicate that communicates action or a state of being for the subject. The subject is typically the noun or the pronoun that is doing the verb, and the verb is the action that is actually taking place. So for example, I am writing a blog about ATITs, English and language usage. In that sentence, I am the subject and I'm writing is the verb. The sentence is about the subject, I, and what am I doing? I'm writing a blog. So you will also need to be able to recognize incomplete sentences or sentence fragments which are missing a subject and or a predicate. So for example, hoping to increase my score. The sentence is missing a subject, so it's really incomplete. If it was written as, I am hoping to increase my score, it would make much more sense, right? Now that the sentence has a subject, I, and the verb, I am hoping, it becomes a complete sentence. You also have imperative sentences, and these can be complete sentences as long as the subject and predicate are present. The imperative form of a sentence is typically used when giving a command or making a request. So for example, finish your homework. In this sentence, you, is understood to be the subject, and finish is the predicate. This is an example of an imperative sentence. Another great thing about sentences are transitions. Transition words are used to connect ideas and relationships between ideas. Transition types can include agreement, opposition, cause, effect, examples, conclusion, chronology, as well as locations. So here are a couple examples of transition words that would signal agreement. Also, certainly, indeed, in fact, naturally, of course, and surely. Here are some examples of transition words that would signal opposition. Although, conversely, despite, however, in contrast, instead, nevertheless, on one hand, on the other hand, but otherwise, regardless, still, and yet. That might have triggered some people with a couple of those words, right? I know it did me. <laughs> uh, you'll also need to be able to identify how ideas are related to each other in the text. So for example, the boy likes birds, but he was afraid of cats. In this sentence, but is used as a transition word to signal the second part of a sentence is in opposition to the first. Let's talk about tense. So tense refers to at what point in time an action is taking place. The basic tenses can be past, present, and future. However, there are also variations of these tenses. So for example, the present tense can be further divided into present simple and present progressive. It is important to be able to identify the use of the appropriate tense when you are writing or reading a passage. So for example, yesterday I went to the store. This is past tense, right? This happened yesterday, it happened in the past. Next example, I am going to the store. This is present progressive tense, right? It's happening in the present. Next example, I will go to the store. This is future tense, right? I haven't actually gone yet, but I will go to the store. So diction is the word choice that an author makes. An author's diction can shape the tone and mood of the writing and what you're reading. 
So mood is the feeling that the author is trying to communicate to the reader. Whereas tone is how the author's words makes that reader feel. So for example, if the author writes, the sky is blue, the tone can be interpreted as positive or negative based on the mood of the rest of the text. If the author writes, I am excited to go on vacation, that tone sounds typically positive, right? That is how you're going to perceive it. But if the author writes, I can't believe I have to work on vacation, this tone is very negative. It's just the way that it reads. You will also need to be able to, be able to identify the differences between the author's mood and tone based on the word choices that they choose. So let's talk about run-on sentences. If anybody has written a paper in APA format, you're very well aware that some professors will actually ding points on you when you have run-on sentences. But you might be like, what does that mean? Well, a run-on sentence is two or more complete sentences that are incorrectly joined together. There are three main ways to fix a run-on sentence. The first way is to use a period between two complete sentences. So for example, I have a cat, his name is Mittens. There's no distinguish, there's no period in between the two, but they are two complete sentences put together incorrectly. What you can do is add a period in between these two sentences. I have a cat, period, his name is Mittens, period. That separates those two complete sentences and makes it not a run on sentence. The second way is to fix a run-on sentence is with a comma or conjunction. So for example, you might say, I have a cat, comma, and his name is Mittens. In this sentence, the comma is used to join the two complete sentences together, and the conjunction and is used to signal that the second part of the sentence is related to the first. The last way that you can fix run-on sentences is by using a semicolon. So for example, I have a cat, semicolon, his name is Mittens. In this sentence, the semicolon is used to join the two complete sentences together. You really need to know how to fix run-on sentences because it will be something that you will be tested on with your ATITs. So next we're gonna move on to evaluating if language meets the need of an audience for a provided rhetorical context. And we're gonna begin by identifying a narrator's setting or scenario. When you're reading a text, it's really important to be able to identify the narrator's setting or scenario. The setting is the time and place that the story is taking place, and the scenario is a series of events that make up the story. So for example, it was a dark and stormy night. That's really a setting, right? It's really laying the groundwork of what is happening in the story. It's dark and it's rainy and it's stormy. The boy was walking home from school when he saw a cat in the tree. This is the scenario, right? These are the series of events that are starting to make up the story. We know that the setting is it's dark and it's stormy and this poor little boy is walking home from school when he sees a cat in the tree. When you're reading these passages, you will need to ask yourself these questions. Who is telling the story? When and where is the story taking place? What series of events are making up this story? Who is the attended audience for this story? And what is the author's overall style? Next, we're gonna take a look at formal and informal language. Starting with formal language, this is a kind of language that is used in a formal setting, such as a classroom or if you're in a business meeting. Formal language is usually more precise and less personal than other kinds of languages. So for example, what is your name? This is a formal way to ask someone what their name is. What's your name, dude? This is obviously less formal, right? When you're asking for someone's name. The tone of a formal language tends to be serious as well as neutral. So writings include humorous or ironic texts are usually not considered formal language. Informal language. Informal language is a kind of language that uses a less formal type of language in a less formal setting. So this is usually when you're hanging out with your family or friends. Informal language is usually more personal and less precise than other kinds of language. So for example, what's your name? Is an informal way to ask someone their name. 
Now you might be asking yourself in your previous example, what is the difference? Well, instead of saying, what is your name? We combine what is and make the word what's. That's what makes the sentence less formal. So in this sentence, what's your name? Less formal or informal. What is your name is more formal. Or you could even say, what is your name, sir? That's even more formal when you're asking for someone's name. When you're looking at tone of informal language, this can be a more conversational language. So it can include text that is, of course, humorous as well as ironic. Slang is also another form of informal language that is very casual and is often used by a specific group of people. So for example, what's up? That is a form of slang. It is important to be able to identify the differences between formal and informal language so that you can use that appropriate language to speak to the audience depending on what the question is asking you. Now we have a better understanding of what informal and formal language looks like. One of the things the ATITs is going to ask you is to revise informal and formal languages as well as culturally diverse languages. It's really important that you're able to identify these so that you can make the appropriate changes based on what the question is asking you. So here are some tips for revising informal language to make it more formal. You wanna use standard English rather than slang and contractions. We talked about that before. What is versus what's are two completely different forms of language. What is is more formal, whereas what's is more informal. Use specific and concrete language rather than vague or general language. Use a formal tone rather than that conversational tone we talked about before. So for example, instead of saying, I'm going to the store, say, I am going to the store. You're going to use I am as a formal language and you're gonna use the word I'm as informal language. Here are some tips for revising formal language to make it more informal. Use contractions such as don't or can't. Remember, contractions are really good when it comes to informal language. You can also use slang as well as colloquial expressions. And use a conversational tone. It's like you're talking to your friends and family. So for example, instead of saying, I cannot come to the meeting, you can say, I can't make it to the meeting. Culturally diverse audiences have never been more important than it has been in present day history, what we are experiencing right now. It's really important that when you are writing for a culturally diverse audience, that you understand and are aware of the different cultural backgrounds that your audience may have. So some things that you might wanna consider when you are writing a passage is you wanna use language that is inclusive of all cultures, genders, races, and religions. Avoid using any kinds of stereotypes or making assumptions about your audience's culture. And be aware of the different connotations that word may have in different cultures. So for example, instead of saying he is from a different culture, you could say he comes from a diverse background. Something else that's really important is identifying gender bias language, and this ultimately should be avoided as well. So for example, instead of saying a physician should explain the procedure to his clients, right? That is making an assumption that all physicians are male. You could say physicians should explain procedure to their clients. As we know, we have a whole bunch of physicians that are female, male, and may identify as some other kind of gender. So it's really important when you get these types of questions that you recognize gender bias languages and avoid them at all costs. Moving on to our last portion of this particular section of the ATITs is how to develop a well-organized paragraph. And we're gonna start with knowledge of language, right? This is what this whole portion is about. The ability to use language effectively is really important in all aspects of your life. Whether you are writing a paper for school, communicating with coworkers, or simply just talking to your friends, being able to use language correctly will help you become more clear and concise. On the ATITs, you will need to be able to identify conventions of paragraph development, including topic sentences, supporting details, transitions, and conclusions. 
We went really into depth of this with the reading portion of the ATITs that I filmed. Please go back and check that out to make sure that you are very well familiar with these particular topics. You're also going to be able to know how to revise irrelevant information where more information is needed. So let's begin by looking at parts of a paragraph. In order to develop a well-organized paragraph, it is important to understand the different parts that occur within that paragraph. A paragraph is a group of related sentences that share a common topic. A paragraph usually starts with a topic sentence, which introduces the main idea of the paragraph. The rest of the paragraph should provide supporting details for that main idea. And a paragraph should also have a conclusion, which summarizes the main idea of what you read. So for example, if the topic sentence is, I like to eat ice cream, the supporting details might be, ice cream is my favorite dessert. I always have ice cream after dinner. And the conclusion might be, I really enjoy eating ice cream. Another example of a topic sentence could be, Jessica is an excellent student. The supporting details might be that she is intelligent and responsible. Jessica always does her homework and she is never late for classes. She receives high scores for all of her work. The conclusion might be, as a result of her hard work, Jessica is one of the best students in school. When you are creating paragraphs, it's really important to put them in logical order. When you're writing them, you really have to understand what logically makes sense when I am writing this paragraph. You can do that by number one, making sure that that first sentence in your paragraph introduces the topic. Number two, every sentence that follows that should provide some kind of supporting details for the topic sentence. And number three, the last sentence of the paragraph should conclude and summarize the main idea of that passage. It is often best to organize paragraphs in chronological order. This means that the sentences will be arranged in the order for which they happened. So for example, if you're writing about a trip to the school, you may arrange the sentences in the order of which they happened. First, we went to see the elephants, then we went to see the lions, and after that, we went and saw the monkeys. If you're writing about more than one topic, then you can arrange the paragraphs in order of importance. The most important information should be in the first paragraph, with the following paragraphs providing supporting details. So for example, if you are writing about your favorite book and your favorite movie, you might start the paragraph off about what your favorite book was and then start talking about the movie, especially in situations where the book was written first and then the movie was created afterwards. And lastly, we're going to discuss identifying unnecessary and omitted information. When you're writing a paragraph, it's really important to include only relevant information for that paragraph. If you include information that is not related to the topic sentence, it's considered unnecessary information. So for example, if the topic sentence is, I like ice cream, including a sentence about your favorite color doesn't make sense. And that particular sentence is considered unnecessary information. If you leave out information that is relevant to the topic sentence, then that is considered omitted information. So again, for example, if the topic sentence is I like ice cream, but you don't mention what flavor of ice cream you like, then that might be considered omitted information. When questioning whether a topic is right for a paragraph, you should ask yourself, does this sentence support the main idea? If it does not, delete it or move the sentence to another paragraph where that sentence would fit better. I hope that the information was helpful in understanding knowledge of language when it comes to ATIT's English and language usage. As always, make sure you leave your comments as well as your questions down below. I love answering your questions. Head over to www.nursechung.com where there is a ton of additional resources available to you to help you pass your ATIT's. And as always, I will see you in the next video. Bye.